um, take you, go quickly through some pictures, actually. Because this was me, and it's hard to believe. <laughs> Sally told me that I was a baby then, but I, I like the little red hanky, the slightly shiny thing, and the, and the dimples. Yeah, I mean, frankly, you can't see the dimples anymore. But th this, that, that's when I started, and it was quite an interesting time. And we I first met Diana around about, actually, 89, before I was doing uh, covering the Royals. And I was supposed to turn up to Balmoral, and... Um, and she was on holiday there with the kids, and I, there was a guy called Jim Bennett, and Jim was a legendary paparazzo photographer, who was, in those days, could roam around Balmoral in the grounds, and the police were quite happy for them to take pictures, etc. So, I, he said, well, you, I don't need you here, I don't even know why you've been sent here. I went, okay. He said, well, go and have a swim in the pool. So I'm in the pool, swimming, minding my own business, and I suddenly look up, and there's sort of four guys with shiny shoes in each corner of this swim area. And I look around, there's nobody else there. I see these two young lads coming down the, 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 the water chute. One of them's got red hair, and I'm thinking, this is a bit worrying. I then look up, and then there's Princess Diana swimming, coming towards me in the pool. So I thought, this is not how it was supposed to be. So I quickly ran off into the sauna, thinking this is the best place to hide. Unfortunately, she then decided to turn up in the sauna, wrapped in nothing but a towel. So this was slightly embarrassing, and she did the shy dye look. And about six months later, I was called in back to, down from, London, from Scotland to London to start this job as a royal correspondent. Went on my first job to Pakistan, where Diana was on a solo tour. And uh, she would always throw a party in those days, like not dissimilar to this, you know, about this sort of number, with the visiting media and the bodyguards, her team. And um, that's when I was introduced to her. To her. I, I you know, slightly nervously went up to her and said, I'm Robert Jobson from The Sun. And, and she was quick as a flash. Everyone dismisses her as a bit thick sometimes, don't it? She said, oh, I'm Princess Diana, welcome to Earth, which I thought was quite sharp. But, <laughs> but she, was, um, she, was, she was in great form always. And she, you know, and there's a lot of nonsense been written about. And that's why I, I, I one of the reasons I wrote a book with them, um, which was called, my th this is not the book, but the first book I wrote was a with a guy called Ken Wolf, who was Diana's protection officer from SO14. Um, it was written five years after her death and was quite controversial at the time. But ended, controversy is good for book sales, I can assure you. It was, when the Daily Mail wrote it was going to be pulped uh, in New York, it sold out that afternoon, so it was pretty good. But um, we tried to, I think, get an authentic voice for, for Diana because if you remember, in the period after she died, and I'll come back to that and take questions on that, because there's always questions about the, the tragedy involving the late princess, we wanted to try to get some authenticity about... Diana about the type of person she was, the funny person that she was, the humour. There was so much talked about her being having a borderline personality disorder and being pretty, you know, basically stark staring bonkers. A load of nonsense, frankly. She was a, she was a, 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 an incredible person that was in diffi incredibly difficult position. You know, she was told knew very early on that the Prince of Wales and Camilla had restarted their affair, and she found that almost impossible to live with, but she did get on with the job, and until sort of 92, you know, we didn't really know that there was anything majorly wrong with that marriage, which is an incredible acting performance. So we wrote this book in 90, 2002, um, on the fifth anniversary of her death, it caused major controversy, because Ken was still, had only just left um, the Royalty and Diplomatic Protection Squad, it was an authentic voice, and it tells, it told the story as he saw it, as her bodyguard. And so it became an international bestseller around the world, um, New York, London, Australia. And it was my first book I wrote. I thought, well, this is easy. <laughs> this, is, this is simple, isn't it, really? You don't have to work too hard. I've, I've written six others since. None of them got anywhere near this one. So um, it's not that easy. So uh, it was one of those situations. But it was an interesting uh, experience. We were both threatened with breaching the Official Secrets Act, um, that we were going to be incarcerated. Uh, he was going to lose his pension. Um, nothing happened. You know, nothing happened at all because actually there were no official secrets breached in the book. It was basically his perspective. And what's interesting now, after I, somebody was talking about the film that just happened, um, there is a we've written a script with a guy that made the madness of King George. Uh, Stephen Evans has done a script based upon this book, and it, and it's with both Ken, myself, and. Um, and uh, Patrick Jefferson, her private secretary, and uh, Richard Kay, who's on the Daily Mail. And so it's a lot more, the script's incredibly authentic compared to that last one, which 
although I liked it, when you were asking about it, I liked that film personally. I went to see it with uh, Dinah's old PA, Victoria Mender, and she thought it was pretty good, actually. She, she thought that I, a lot of people canned it and thought it was a terrible movie. I didn't think the script was very good, but I thought that the acting was brilliant. And I thought it sort of captured the madness of that moment in time. So that was the, that's when I, um, I left my role as assistant editor of The Express to write this book, and it was a big success, so I thought I'll carry on in this vein. Um, and since then, subsequent to that, I've been working um, with the London Evening Standard, and I, um, I was royal editor there. I then was hired for a brief spell, which is marvellously controversial, for a, as a consultant at News International with uh, the News of the World for two years, much long after all this nonsense went on, but it's an interesting experience. You can ask me about that. <laughs> it was um, staggering. Um, and then I'm back at the London Evening Standard as a consultant there, and I work for Channel 7 Australia as their royal correspondent, and um, Good Morning America, as well as uh, Good Morning Britain, as it's now called, and I'll be on that tomorrow, chatting to the, not dancing, but chatting with the lovely Susanna Reid, talking about, uh, uh, di uh, about Kate. So the, 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 latest, uh, the latest whole experience, I think, is, is focused on, on William and Kate, and it's actually been a huge resurgence in, I think, the popularity of the royal family and the way we perceive the royal family. Because in the 90s, it was all about scandal and it was all about affairs. It was all about things that really were not very helpful to Great Britain PLC, not very helpful <laughs> to the image of, of, the, of the royal family. So what this, this new couple, and I wrote this, this was an original book I wrote about them, um, are, good biz are good news for, for, for the royal family. They are fantastic. Uh, a fantastic example. Um, they've had a fantastic honeymoon period too. There's no doubt about that. The, royal, the covering the royal wedding was immense, incredible um, experience. I mean, they erected that village, the media village opposite the palace. Um, I was working then for the Today Show for NBC. It was remarkable. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. The the positivity, the the, the excitement, the crowds. It was absolutely huge and. In America, they had huge viewing figures. Australia to all around the world. So, in terms of, you know, in terms of what do the royal family do for our country? I think they do an awful lot. I mean, they bring in, in terms of the brand, you can't get a better brand. And these two, I think, this couple are an amazing uh, double act. Coming back from Australia, uh, get rid of him. He's, well, that's quite funny too. But I'll come back to that. Um, but of course, they're not the next in line. The next in line is a bit of an issue. We are in a very interesting period. I mentioned the madness of King George. We are in a very interesting period. I'm not saying that Her Majesty is mad in any way, but she is in her 89th year, and we are in a very difficult and different time. Um, and what's happening now is, if you put a few wigs on the characters involved uh, and red coats, you're not far off what's happening happened in the madness of King George, with a lot of vying for political position there's been a lot of talk, I think, in, at the weekend about the role of the Prince of Wales. Is he now a shadow king? Is he a king in waiting? Can he take that role? Will he limit his voice? All of these things are interesting because he doesn't want to do that. Because as Prince of Wales, he doesn't have to do it. He, he's constitutional. He can say what he likes. He can do pretty much what he likes, which we've just seen with the comments about President Putin, which went around the world. The Queen couldn't possibly do anything like that. And if Prince Charles adopted, if you like, a quasi shadow king role as his mother gets older he couldn't do it either and he's very much against being drawn into that and there was a there was a whole there's a whole new dimension to that happening at this very moment so the next in line has always been a bit of a problem I, I was lucky enough to break the story that Charles and Camilla were to marry in 2005 and it was a big story I won Super of the Year for it with the London Press Club and it was a moment in time, and everyone now says, oh yeah, Charles and Camilla, they were always going to get married. Well, actually, at the time, no one really believed that would happen, and they didn't think it was possible. But So by breaking that story um, for the London Evening Standard, um, it was a big moment in time, a historical moment. It's never been done in history before. It's always They've always done their own announcements, and it led to a whole period of confusion for the British royal family because they hadn't really prepared it. They were supposed to be getting married at Windsor Castle, but what actually happened is they didn't realise, once I'd broken the story, they hadn't dotted all the I's and crossed the T's, it meant 
that they said, well, we're going to get married at Windsor Castle. By doing so, the civil ceremony, it meant that anybody could get married at that venue um, for a period, I think it is, of six months, which was a problem, of course, because the Queen didn't really want everybody traipsing in. I think Elton and, 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 and uh, his partner, David. David, said that they wanted to get married <laughs> as a result. And so you ended up with not only this strange